It's the week ending Saturday, the 27th of May, and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen President Trump travelling to the Middle East, a U-turn by Theresa May over her plans for social care, and of course, a major terrorist attack in Manchester. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And with me today from the week's digital team are Jonathan Harwood, Elizabeth Carellis and Cameron Tate. Uh, starting the show with his top pick of the week is Jonathan. What have you brought with you? It's Sunday. Let's see what's on BBC Radio Leeds. And here are your musical clues then all linked to someone uh, well known who's been in the news this week. <laughs> It gets worse, incredibly, but uh, that clip from Nathan Turvey's show on BBC Radio Leeds on Sunday, it was a phone-in quiz. The answer was Ian Brady. They played it out three times, someone called and got the right answer. Seemingly, no one, not the producer, not an executive, thought as they were playing this out, this is in bad taste. Yeah, it's it's an astonishing um, start or end to the weekend. The the BBC have apologised, understandably, but the the fact that their story begins with the words a light-hearted music quiz about the Moors murderer Ian Brady almost sums up the the insanity of the situation. I don't know what possessed them. It brings up issues of of acceptability and what goes beyond the pale. It was a, a bad taste feature, and an error of judgment to play it out on BBC Local Radio. I mean, it, you could just about get away with it in a Chris Morris sketch, couldn't you? But even then, you'd think, well, that's in questionable taste. Yeah, if it was a Chris Morris sketch, there'd be people complaining about it then. Too. Yeah, exactly. But for a show that's aimed at sort of literally people in their 80s, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So what? what? What are the repercussions of this story? I think it's, it, it's an interesting question of when things become acceptable to make light of. Not that they're making light of it, but, but you know, when they become part... They are part- making light of it. It's supposed to be funny isn't it yeah. all the young dudes yeah uh, well i mean suffer the, the children i yeah. mean that's sort of a joke about it isn't yeah, it i mean the brady bunch it's not yeah a, i mean as a quiz it's not even a very good quiz yeah. it's just, <laughs> just so obvious it, obviously it's a long time ago now it's 50 years since the, the horrors that he committed and if it was another 50 years you look at jack the ripper that that would kind of be acceptable now most people would think that would be fine the acid bath murderers those those things are kind of down in british folklore now and the regarded as things that are acceptable to not perhaps joke about but talk about in a offhand manner whereas this is a bit too close to the bone i would have to disagree with jonathan actually i don't think you could do a music quiz like this about jack the ripper either it's just extremely bad taste and i don't think you could do it about anybody who has killed anybody and say oh well you know we just didn't get the timing right so are there any rules then I mean, how do you decide? Because taste and decency is something we just rely on executives in charge of these things to sort of innately understand. I mean, there are codes of practice, but it's it's a learned thing, isn't it? It's like it's like behaviour as a child. It just it's ingrained into you as you as you grow up. And perhaps actually one of the things that does affect it is social media and the modern age we live in, because once you would snigger behind your hand at things that are uh, so beyond the pale, but now you see the jokes on Twitter, it's in the mainstream, you know, they're actually in front of you on a, t- on a computer screen as opposed to being talked about by adults. Yeah, now Cameron, you're nodding along with that. I think it, it does depend on, on kind of external influences and to, and to how you assess the situation. Following Brady's death, the families came out and said, it doesn't change anything, it, it still really affects us, we are destroyed by the events of what happened. And for me, that's a good gauge of saying, look, this is a subject that we shouldn't touch. It's still very new in people's minds. Let's do something else. But the social media influence is interesting, isn't it? And actually, you know, here we are sitting on a podcast. People say things on podcasts that they wouldn't say on mainstream radio. I host a comedy show myself. I could imagine riffing on songs to do with Ian Brady, but the context would be different. A, it's a comedy show. B, it's people that have chosen to listen to it. C, you're not asking an audience to call in and contribute. Um, and it would clearly be a spontaneous gag. You'd still think very carefully about whether or not to include that. But that, the fact that that platform exists is new. Yeah, and you'd, you'd be talking about the issue as opposed to the actual man. 
Not necessarily. I mean, there are bad taste podcasts out there that would be making these jokes and have been for years. Tasteless jokes have gone on for ages. Freud wrote about it, the need to make a tasteless joke after something horrendous happens. It's how you react to something. I am actually a bit with Jimmy Carr on this, and that's not words I say often, where just because people are offended doesn't mean it's wrong. But you have to weigh up the taste part of it. You can have a tasteless joke if the subject of it is not the victims. Mm. So for little children, mm. you're kind of inciting people to, to laugh at the victims, going, you know, here we are, those poor little kids died, you know? Um, I mean, this week as well, we, we're sort of skipping around Manchester because clearly that is the biggest story of the week and that's not what we do on this show. But, it, you know, the, the fact, as you suggested, that innocent children lost their lives within 48 hours of that broadcast. I mean, unfortunately for Nathan Turvey, because, I mean, clearly he had nothing to do with that, but it did throw it into relief a bit. You know, it, it made people understand the impact of losing children in that region. And also we saw, as a result of what happened in Manchester, a similar insensitivity in, in the mainstream media, didn't we? I mean, Katie Hopkins' final solution comment, for example. Yeah. That was just pure... Katie Hopkins. Yeah, yes. yeah. Let's not talk about Katie Hopkins, but I mean, but there have been talks, discussions about you know sensitivity of the idea that a baby's been on the front of newspapers. You know, is is that is that acceptable? This guy, you know, why why even give him the uh, allow him to exist in in the annals of history? You should you know should he not be expunged? And uh, you know, the idea that his face is plastered on national newspapers is 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 hugely controversial. But the, where the two events might have something in common, I'm, uh, what I'm getting at is is this slight erosion of decency that may have come about because of the internet and people expecting news first and expecting yeah. opinion first. And in in the old days, someone like Katie Hopkins would have made that comment after a week, not on the day. And it would have been difficult for her to find a, a platform to make it on as well. But now on Twitter, it's, it's easy. I find it very disturbing how you see pictures that you would not see in newspapers or in the press on social media as well. And I think that's eroding the idea of what's decent to show. After the Westminster attacks, for example, some of the pictures that were shown on social media would never have been published in any newspaper I've worked at. We would have found them too gory and too disturbing for the victims' families to have shown them. But there they are, plastered for millions and millions and millions of people to see worldwide. And, and then once they've been published on one source, it becomes okay to publish them again. For example, the pictures that the, new, the American press have got, uh, which yeah. the British press refused to publish. But as soon as they're in the Washington Post or wherever it was, they're now all over the British press. And this sense of, of what window is reasonable. You know, we saw politicians stop their campaigning for a couple of days, didn't we? Uh, and then decide that on Friday they were going to start campaigning again. UKIP went one day earlier. Uh, presumably because their manifesto has an element of Islamophobia in it. There was a, an agreement amongst everyone that there should be a day where there's no campaigning at all. I mean, who decides these periods? You know, is it, it is bad taste, isn't it, for the, tr for, for the Prime Minister to make a speech about anything else for the next few days? But it's going to happen. There's a website called Sickopedia, which is just full of sick jokes. There are already jokes about Manchester starting now. It's jokes about Roger Moore's death as well. And, and you were talking about the need to have sick jokes. Working in newsrooms, I think I've I've heard them all. You, it's gallows humour. It's a way that people survive and get around it. Because if not, you'd be sitting in a corner with the gin crying. You've got to make light of a tough situation. If you didn't laugh, you would cry. Yeah. And the thing about a sick joke is, it's not meant to be taken out of context. It's almost a bonding thing between two people. Often, I mean, we're not talking about schoolboys sniggering about Jimmy Savile, which is just sort of you know weird. But it's um you know it's when something's really affected you and you want to making light of it with a friend is a way of dealing with it. OK, let's move on. Let's uh, head to you, Elizabeth, and tell us what you've brought with you this week. Oh, I'm so happy that now saying I want to have your baby isn't going to be banned on the first date. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can raise a child. Um, we, we introduce people, so does Tinder, so do a whole lot of agencies out there. We make an introduction. We're not um, providing a baby. We're not a stalk service where we deliver babies off the shelf, you know. We make introductions between two people and those two people, that's where the magic, that's where the real magic happens is between those two people. Paul Ryan talking to BBC News about his new app Just a Baby. Uh, Elizabeth, we get an idea from what he was saying about what his app does, but for the avoidance of doubt, could you provide a summary for us please? Basically this app will let you swipe right to find like-minded people who also want to have children. This could be finding a partner, 
to have the baby with or it could be offering sperm or eggs up for donations it could be people looking if they're in same-sex marriages and they want to have a child looking for somebody to help out and i'm guessing that you're not a fan I don't know why you you tend not you tend to bring things that you're not a fan of. <laughs> so, so much of this disturbs me. The name for a start, just a baby. I don't have children. I don't know a single parent who would say it's just a baby. It's not just a baby. It's a ten thousand pound year liability for the next eighteen years. This whole app is trying to make out that it's helping people when really it's making light of what should be well no what is the most important decision a person will make which is to have a family with somebody you love but it doesn't necessarily does it minimize the baby calling it just a baby what what i took it to mean was i'm looking for only a baby not a relationship and and that's something that's happened socially and anecdotally for ages it's something that happens at sperm clinics it's just now convenient but he does he does say it is for people who want relationships I too. I know he does, but he launched it at the Mardi Gras. I mean, it's, it seemed fairly obvious to me that originally it was for same-sex couples who were looking for a child, and, and now it's become maybe you could meet someone that you want to date as well. If you listen to him, that is not at all what he was saying. He talks about people being in their 30s, time's running out, relationships are quick, he says, they don't last. So your relationship might not last, but hey, you get a baby. It's a bit like the goldfish at the... Fairground, you know, your love life hasn't worked out, but never mind, you've got a nice consolation prize, haven't you? Cameron, am I being cynical about this? It just seems to me that Elizabeth's sort of taken in by all of the bump that he says. It's a bit like the Ashley Madison thing, isn't it? He's come out and sort of made a controversial series of statements that Elizabeth has fallen for hook, line and sinker, whereas it was actually... Oh, it's yeah. it's just an app to help gay couples find someone who might have their baby, and that's what's happening anyway. I am completely torn on this, on this app uh, for many reasons. And the first thing is... Any way that a same-sex couple can go and, and kind of easily get a child, I think, is, is fantastic. But I can't help but think in the back of my mind, it's going to get abused. Because, I, you know, all of these apps get abused. Tinder gets abused. It was meant to be for meeting friends and getting a relationship. But we now know it's used for something very different. And I can't help but think that these people are in a situation of where they're thinking, I want to get serious now. I want to go and have a child. And there will be someone else out there who could really abuse that. But how? I mean, because when you say Tinder's used for something different, you mean casual sex. I mean, what's yes. the casual equivalent of having a baby? If you do have a baby on, on a whim, then you're left with a baby. It's not something you can walk away from. But you might go into it not really committed to it. You might just think, OK, no, there it is. It's simple for me. Yeah, I but can you just... won't because it's a baby. I mean, isn't it just the same as finding a property on a property website? I mean, that's a, you know, 300 grand commitment. You don't think oh, I'll just toss this off, do you? You think, you know, I've found it easily through the internet, but it's an important purchase. But if you go into that relationship thinking, you know, this person wants a baby with me, that is the whole focus of your relationship then. That's not a good basis. Why? To build it's honest. it on. Isn't it better to be honest right for me? This is what we both want. I do agree. There is something to be said for having that talk straight away and not finding out three years into your relationship that your partner doesn't want a baby. But if you're waiting three years into your relationship to have that talk, maybe that relationship isn't as honest as you would think. And if you come out of that relationship and you're worried that you haven't been honest with each other and you're looking not to repeat the mistake again, why not use an app that says, I'm just going to be straight up right from the beginning. I'm only going to find someone who wants a baby. Because love doesn't work that oh, way. Oh, because that's love. Not why oh, that's where we're going, going, is it? Oh, okay, because love. Me. Okay, so how do we stand on this? Technology versus love. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it's, it's technology is not the friend of romance, is it really? But then on the other hand, you, know, it's, it's, you could kind of view it as, an, as a next step in that sort of march away from traditional romantic notion of, of love and what, what have you. I mean, everyone meets on dating sites now, don't they? Why now, now they're breeding on dating sites. Mm. It's, it's, just, it's an extension of that. It's not just the love part, though. There are so many legal and financial issues surrounding this. The guy has a small disclaimer saying you should go find independent advice before you embark on some of these relationships. If you donate sperm, you are that child's father if it does not come through a licensed premise. That woman could say, I don't want anything from you. And then five years later, you're getting hit with the CSA. I think it should come with a ready reckoner from the CSA saying this is how much this child will cost you. What about the child? What happens when it gets to the age of 18 and thinks, okay, so one of my parents has told me that I am the product of an, of an app. I want to go and start a family now. Whereas you might find that one of those parents just wanted to have a baby and 
you know, wants to help somebody out and then we'll, we'll leave. You know, this is a huge responsibility that is being accessed by swiping right. I find that odd. That is the hardest thing I find about the app. What also disturbs me is when you read the comments and you read people who've been interviewed in the press about it, how free and easy comes up all the time. This is an easy way to do it. This is an easy way to do it. Having a child should not be easy. Yeah, if but you're it shouldn't necessarily be as expensive as it is either. I mean, the red tape is one thing because you're right. You know, a, a lot of the, the egg and, and donor clinics and everything, there's red tape for a reason, which yeah. is mm-hmm. there are legal issues and they want to support people if they have trauma through it and all the rest of it. But the cost, especially in places like America, you know, this guy's saying, well, you, you don't have to pay anything because if you do it through me, it is free. It's a way of introducing you to other people. But it takes away the checks and balances, doesn't it? You know, in a way that if you do it through an established mechanism, then those checks and balances are there for a reason because they've they've grown up with the system that's grown up. This is to parenthood what Uber is to licensed taxis. You know, <laughs> it's, it's it's just different, and then, and only time will tell what the impact's going to be. Yeah, I mean, I do think Cameron's point is interesting. If you if you grow up the product of an app, your implication was that that child might actually be cool with it in the sense that, you know, it's almost self-selecting. People who want to have only babies and not relationships then breed and create children who are, think like that as well. <laughs> exactly. It, I guess it depends on, on the environment that the child grows up in. If they, if the parent's straight and says, look, you are the product of an app, um, this, is, this was a time in my life and I haven't got a problem with it or, or, or whatever, the child might be okay with it. But and imagine they might it, be traumatized is the other side of They it, might right? be traumatized. Yeah, they, they really could be. And it's the same with, you know, it's the same with adoption. You know, you could, you could see exactly the same thing. If finances are a factor in finding your baby father or mother, then I don't think that's a very good factor for finding your baby father or mother. If you're looking for somebody who's not going to cost you that much, then maybe you should be thinking, can I really afford a baby in the first place? Cameron, what do you think this week will be remembered for? It turns out there is such a thing as being too safe. Today, we're taking another step forward in biometric security, pushing past the limits of what many believe possible. The Note 7 comes with an iris scanner. So how does it work? Well, we developed our own proprietary algorithm to map the contours of your iris and the pattern of it and translate it into a unique digital signature. It took five years to perfect but it only takes a glance to unlock your phone. Justin Dennison there unveiling his exploding phone back in 2016, the Samsung Note, uh, discussing its latest impenetrable security feature, the Retina Scan. Now, Cameron, the Note is no longer with us. It's no longer with uh, us. But the Retina Scan remains on Samsung devices. It does. What happened next? So it debuted on the explosive Note 7. Uh, Obviously, the Note 7 wasn't around for very long, so it went away and it didn't appear on any other Samsung devices until the Galaxy S8, which was announced uh, last month. People can now unlock their phone using their irises. Instead of scanning your finger or typing a button in, you can basically look at your phone and it'll unlock for you. You can even make purchases by looking at your phone. But researchers have found that if you take a picture of your eye, an infrared picture, place a contact lens over it and hold it up to the phone, your phone will unlock. Why would you do that? The idea of the security system is, is it's meant to be foolproof. You know, no one, there is no way that you can replicate the issue. Uh, you, it has to be, you look at the, the screen and that's it. But obviously, taking a picture of somebody's eye, it's not difficult. I'm not the best photographer, but it, I don't think it's particularly difficult. Getting hold of a contact lens isn't particularly difficult. I, I still don't understand the, me- the mechanic you're describing. Yes. You, would you put a contact lens over a picture? Yes, you put the contact lens over the picture of the eye. What? And then hold it up to the phone, and the phone will unlock. It probably adds a, a third dimension to the picture. I see. As so well. they've tested it on their own eye, so that they're yes. not done for hacking phones. But yes. basically, they're telling you how to hack a phone. Yes. And you've just told all our listeners how I've to hack a phone. I've just told all your. It's, it's <laughs> so beyond that everywhere. public service. <laughs> um, what's your concern here? So my biggest concern is. <laughs> I mean, it's fairly obvious, but you know, let's spell it out. <laughs> my biggest concern is: Are we going to get to a point with phones? You know, the big selling point of a smartphone is the security features. Obviously, it started off with the four-digit pin that moved to a six-digit pin that moved to a fingerprint scanner and that has now moved to an eye sensor. And on most smartphones, you can use all of them at once. But doesn't that... Obviously, if you've got one of them that's not performing up to scratch with the others, aren't you going to have essentially a back door that someone could open up? Someone could steal my phone and, you know, there is a chance that they could get into it. 
But phone companies have been honest that they're not completely impenetrable. I mean, I know he sounded just then in that clip we played at Samsung like he was very much a fan of the technology. But they have been honest that they don't work at 100%, and that's why they recommend double verification, isn't it? They recommend thumbprint and PIN code or whatever it is. Exactly, yes. So there are, there are ways of, of getting around it. You can have double verification, or they say activate all features at once. But if I, have, if I activated all features at once, including the iris scanner, and I look at my phone and it unlocks, it doesn't matter about the others because I'm not using them. The option remains, though, doesn't it, not to have any security at all? I mean, you know, the security only exists because the phone companies thought, you know, we should put in extra levels of security. I, do they only... I sometimes think that they've done that just so they can talk about it. It's just a gimmick, isn't it? It's a selling point. It's not, there's no practical use for it. Yeah, at the end of the day, it comes across as a big selling point because we're all concerned about our data. We're all a, we don't want people going into our phones. But if you think about it, in the most logical sense, it's probably easier to just have a six-digit code on your device that you remember or you write down somewhere and keep it stored in a safe or whatever. And you don't even need to worry about these fingerprint scanning gimmicks or eye scanning. I mean, Elizabeth, if, if we were to meet on a date through Just a Baby, how easy would it be for me to access your phone if you went for a toilet break? I have a really old phone, so it would be quite difficult because it doesn't have any of these features at all. Well, hold on, I remember the Nokia 3310 just had button and then star. That unlocked it. That Everyone's was the same. What's yours got? Yeah, but I didn't have my bank details on the 3310. Yeah. I had Snake yeah. and that was it. So you would have seen how great I was on Snake and that was <laughs> all. You wouldn't have found out any other details. I just think people have to use your common sense. Nothing is infallible. We hear about things being hacked all the time. You cannot rely on a password to do it. It's like parking your Bentley with your mother's maiden name for the key. Mm you wouldn't do it. So why do you put all your details on a phone? I suppose because companies like Apple and Samsung and HTC make amazing technology, don't they? You know, we can be sniffy about it. I made a joke about the exploding phone, yes. But actually, you know, they have completely changed the way that most of us live in the last few years. They are doing incredible things. They have the world's best engineers. And so there's a level of brand trust, isn't there? Despite problems they've had in the past, where people think, well, if Samsung say this is safe and they've put zillions of dollars into it, then this must be safe. It is a bit like just a baby where it's easy. So people do it. They, why do they use your iris to buy a pizza? Because it's easy to do it. That's it. Obviously, with a lot of recent uh, terror attacks or crimes, there's a lot of smartphones that can't be entered because... Basically, the, the culprit won't hand over his security details. But wouldn't something like having an iris scanner where you could just take a picture of their eye and get into their phone, wouldn't that be quite a suitable backdoor? And would we be happy to have that on our smartphones? Well, this, this, this is a sort of conundrum about the whole thing. On the one hand, you're saying um, we should have a security. And then you're saying, and this is excellent because it's easily easy to break if you're the state. I mean, <laughs> surely the, they're looking at the wrong end of the problem. If, you're, if people are really concerned about security and their information, then we shouldn't be looking at what governments want to do with it. I mean, you look at the, um, the Tory party manifesto and these great, huge boasts about how they're going to restrict internet access and you can't look at this, you won't be able to look at that, the state will be able to check your browsing history willy-nilly. These things are more concerning to me than um, whether or not my iris could be photographed and have a lens put on it and they get into my Samsung. Why? What's in your browsing history? None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back to Elizabeth's point of using some common sense. You know, don't leave your whole life on your smartphone because there will be some way that someone's going to be able to get into it. I mean, this is something that obviously was in development for five years and was hacked within a month. When Apple introduced their fingerprint scanner, that was hacked within about five minutes of it going on sale. It was something that was sorted out so quickly. So, yeah, maybe the, maybe the moral of the story is use a bit of common sense. Don't keep your life on your phone. Well, you've chosen this as a story with repercussions. I would put it to you that repercussions are increased indifference. People have such trust in these devices and yeah, OK, well, that can be hacked. So therefore, yeah. everything can be hacked. So therefore... We live in a world where stuff gets hacked. I guess you've got to really outweigh it. If you've got stuff that's not particularly sensitive and you're, you want a bit of convenience, loads of security options for you that's going to make life easier. But if you've got sensitive data that you don't want other people getting hold of, just go back to basics. Use a good old-fashioned password or lock. 
Yeah, but do keep listening to podcasts because we are the iris scanner of the audio world. We bring you all the news you need to know and you don't have to bother actually reading any of it. It's just straight into your ears. Uh, That is it for this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Jonathan Harwood, Elizabeth Carr-Ellis and Cameron Tate. For more from The Week, why not visit theweek.co.uk, download our free iPhone app, The Weekday, or get the magazine direct to your door. Just head to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. And you can find this podcast on all podcast apps. Just search for The Week unwrapped i've been ollie man our music is by tom morby the producer matt hill at rethink audio until we meet again to unwrap next week bye bye. so have you had to go in the tesla yet i have indeed whoa i was not expecting you to say that i know it's uh it, no it came whoa, around i thought you were too young what happened well Did i you was fake your eyes with a scanner <laughs> i was allowed to drive it if i had a tesla representative with me <laughs> Um, it's, Were you on a lead? I, <laughs> I didn't have to hold hands. No, it was fine. They just sat next to me, ran me through the car, uh, and I got I got about an hour to drive it. Amazing car. It's I think what I found so striking is because it's an electric car, you expect it to be very different to the, the normal cars that you drive, but it's actually very similar. Um, the only thing is it's is it's very quiet. Um, fast though, right? You put your foot to the floor. Not necessarily. No, it's very oh, civilized. Cameron, so there is, there honestly, is. You know, well, you've been teasing us for months. You finally get to be in the Tesla. You didn't even put your foot down. I know, but well, this is this is what we do at the week. We like to we like to look beyond the zero to sixty times of the Model S. Um, <laughs> I'm here to do a thorough summary. But it does. It does. I'm not here for cheap thrills. <laughs> it does take a long time to charge the car up to do those yeah, zero yeah. to whatever, sixty. Whatever. We'll need to find another running seconds, joke for next. So. <laughs> What's the next car you're trying to get into? Uh, I'm going to try and see if I can get into Mercedes E-Class or BMW's new 5 Series. 5 Series. Okay, I'll tease you about that.